Amen. Good evening. Good evening. May the Lord bless you. It's a pleasure to see you all here once again. And as I was meditating on, on the English ministry that we have started here on House of Prayer, I was meditating uh, on how we started the Spanish ministry. And an image came to my head when, when I was preaching into the Spanish service and, and there was only a couple of people sitting on the chairs. And I remember having one of the ladies that was sitting on the chairs ask me, and she asked me, I don't understand, you're preaching and you're looking this way and that way, but it's only us here. And I was like, I remember, I remember telling her, I said, well, one day there'll be more people. <laughs> but until then, we're preaching to, to the people that are here and whoever is watching us online too. And even though it's only a few of us, I know that God will speak to our heart. And I'm going through a series of messages on the English and Spanish ministry that I have titled Building Upon the Word. And we've been talking about how we need, or the necessity of building on the Word of God, on edifying on the word of God. And before we continue, I would like to pray and let's ask for the Lord guidance. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We ask you that on this day that we honor our mothers, as we gather as brothers and sisters in faith, we come before you with one heart. We want to know you more. Dear Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts. We want to know you each time a little bit more so that we won't sin against you. So that we will sanctify our lives, God, in your word. We ask you that you will speak to us this evening. Speak to our heart. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And when I'm saying we're building upon the word, I'm referring to building our faith and our daily lives as believers. And as, as, as we go on in our Christian life, we say that it's a, it's a race of a lifetime. It's not just a race of a few years. It's a race of a lifetime because as we are in this life, we're going to continuously, uh, we, we want to continuous, continuously grow in the faith, laying one brick at a time through the Word of God. And I remember a story of a church member that came to his pastor and as he came to his pastor, he said, Pastor, I'm leaving the church. And the pastor asked him why. He said, why are you leaving the church? He said, it's because there is a brother is always disagreeing with everything I said. And there is a sister that every time I come to church, I, I hear her gossiping and talking about the other sisters. And then he says, and there is a young man around the church the look how he dressed and nobody calls him uh, calls his attention and he said i just can't stand it anymore i'm leaving and the pastor told him and asked him and he said brother is there can i ask you for something he said of course pastor anything what do you need he said can you give me, can you bring me a cup of coffee make sure that it's full to the top so he said sure i'll do it he went on he grabbed the cup of coffee, and as he came over to the pastor, he said, here is your coffee. He said, I want you to do me a favor. Grab that coffee and go around the church seven times. So he went and grabbed the coffee, and he went around the church seven times. And as he was going with the glass filled of coffee, as pastor requested, he went and gave a few rounds around the church. And when he finished the seventh round, he came to the pastor. And he said to his pastor, he said, hey, uh, here is the coffee. Uh, why do you ask me to do this? The pastor looked at him and he said, let me ask you something. While you were going around the church with the coffee, do you remember what that, what that teenager that you mentioned was wearing? 
He said, actually, I didn't. He says, I was paying attention to, to not spill the cup of coffee that I didn't even pay attention to what he was wearing. He said, do you remember what the lady that was gossiping, what was it that she was saying? Or did you hear her say something? He said, actually, I didn't. Because I was too focused on not spilling the coffee that I didn't hear what she was saying. He said, how about the, the guy or that brother that always contradicts you, that always tries to pick on you? Did you hear him say something? He said, I actually, I kind of hear him saying something as I was walking with the coffee. But I didn't pay attention because I was worried enough to not drop the uh, the glass of coffee that I didn't even pay attention to what he said. So he said, perfect then. You have learned your lesson. He continued to talk to him and he said, I don't understand. He said, when, when you are focused on God, everything else shouldn't affect you because we're focused, we're focused on him. At this point, the man looked at him and he said, Ah, I get it. He said, it is true. I was losing my focus. I was focusing on the wrong things. He said, I need to refocus my attention to what matters, which is Christ, and not to what's going on, to what's going on around us. And this is an extremely important point. Why? Because it's the same thing as... Uh, on what we're talking about building our faith. In order to build our faith, we need to pay attention to what matters the most, and it's the Word of God. So as we're going and building uh, through these messages of, of edifying on the Word of God, we need to focus on what matters the most, which is the Word of God. We have to be, uh, believe the Word of God. We have to build upon the Word of God, uh, the, God's Word. And we, we sing it. We were singing it. The worship, and we were saying that we believe that the Word of God is, is, is truth, that we believe in the Word of God that is here to, to teach us, to edify us. And sometimes we know all these things intellectually, but we don't, we don't really believe them in our hearts. Somebody once said that there is two kinds of people those who believe the word intellectually and those who, who believe the word of God because uh, of experience, because they have experienced the word of God. And God wants us to experience his word. He doesn't want us to just remember his word as a memory verse. He wants us that we believe in his word, that we experientially know his word, that we can feel it within our hearts, rather than just have it in our heads. And we have said, and we have uh, on, our, on our statement of faith here at House of Prayer Fresno, we have it on, on the very beginning of the page. We have this statement, and it says, The Bible is our sole and all-sufficient rule of faith and conduct. And then it says, From it derives the following statement of faith, as a doctrinal foundation that, the ha that in House of Prayer Fresno, governs the learning and the teaching of the Word of God. And this is exactly what we want as House of Prayer Fresno. We believe firmly and we're, we have a conviction that the Word of God or that the Word, the Bible, is the Word of God. And that in it, we can find everything that we need. We can find all the necessary things that we need for our Christian life, for our Christian walk, but also we can find everything we need for our faith, to strengthen our faith so that we can walk in faith. If you go with me to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, before we get into our, our, our message, I would like to continue to build up on the introduction that we left uh, two, we two weeks ago so that we can tie well the message from today. And it is on Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says like this, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who calls us by glory 
and virtue. Let me read it on the New Living Translation. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And I would like to ask, do you believe that? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe what the word of God has to say in order for you to be able to edify your house, your family? In House of Prayer, Fresno, in this church, we do not believe or we do not need any extra biblical revelations. And when I mean, when I said extra biblical, I mean outside of the Bible. We don't need any extra biblical revelations. We don't need extra biblical methods. We're not looking for hearing extra biblical things outside of the Bible. We don't, we're not looking to hear anything, anything else, much less replacing the wisdom that the Word of God brings and replace them with human wisdom. That's not what we want. Because we know as Christians that the Word of God or God's Word is, the, God's words are higher than, than those of men. Isaiah 55 verse 8 says it like this. I'll read it. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. And this is on verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So if we think about this, God's word is better than humans, the human words, than human wisdoms. And for this reason, our search must be constant in the word of God. We must constantly look upon the word of God and build upon the word of God. Since it, was, since, it, since it is the word of God who sanctifies us, the word of God who builds us spiritually. Our Lord Jesus, praying for his disciples, says the following on John chapter 17, verse 17. He say, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, if we take apart this verse and look at the, at the meaning on this verse, I'm sorry, something moved here. It says, uh, John 17, 17, it says, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Now, we said if we take apart this verse, to sanctify comes from the Greek, agiaso, which is to set apart. It means to consecrate, because when you look at this mean set apart, it talks about setting apart for a specific purpose. So setting apart for a specific purpose can derive from the meaning to dedicate. Because you're setting apart, but not just to set apart on its own, but to set apart for a specific purpose or use. So when we say to, for a specific purpose of use, then it can mean the word to dedicate. You set apart, you dedicate it for something specific. Also, the other word that can derive from, those, uh, from to sanctify is to consecrate. Consecrate it also means to set aside or to set apart for a specific use or a specific purpose. So when he says sanctify them in your truth, he's saying you, you set them apart for, with a specific purpose of your truth. Your word is truth. So... As believers, in the Word of God, we're not just transformed. We are make new. We are born again. That's what we are. We are a new creation in the Lord. So when we talk about transformation, it's a transformation that is 100%. It's not just a small transformation because if you think about it, it would be better to say that we are born again, through the work that God did in the cross. 
Now, this new birth or this new devotion produces a purification of life, a consecration to the service of God. So when we have a new life, we're consecrated, consecrated to live pure, to live a new life in Christ. So when John says that sanctify them in your truth, he's saying consecrate them. He said, set them apart for your truth, for your words. And since the word of God is truth, then that should be the standard for the course of the, of the life of the Christian. It should be the standard, the rule for the Christian life. And that's why we said that in House of Prayer, we believe that the word of God is our standard of faith and or of and of our char uh, and of character. This is what it is for us. On John chapter fourteen verse six, Jesus spoke on these verses, and he said, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." Then he says, "No one comes to the Father except through me." So he says, "He's the Word." We know this. This is the verb. We also know as the, uh, we also know them as the logos of God, which is the word of God. But also, he says he's the way and the truth. Now, when John is saying sanctify them on your word, he's saying when he said the expression your word, is is phrase that phrase suggests or suggests that Jesus is referring to himself because he is the way, the truth, and the life. So if he's the truth and the word is truth and the verb was made, was, was make flesh, we know that Jesus is the verb of God, the logos and the word of God. Now, when we understand this and we read John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And then... He goes to Pilate, when he is there with Pilate being arrested, he's about to be sentenced to death. And when he's right there with Pilate on John ch chapter 18, verse 37, Pilate asked him, asked him a question. And the question was, are you the king then? He was asking them a straight question. He's saying, are you a king? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come to this world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, Jesus came as the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the verb that was made flesh. He came as the second person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He comes with one purpose, and his purpose is to save us, to redeem us. And as he comes in, he says, my sheep will hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they, know, and they follow me. And he says on John chapter 10, verse 28, and I give them eternal life, and they should never perish, neither should anyone snatch them out of my hand. Now, when we look at all these words from the Bible, these words that are inspired by God, they're not according to me or to men, they're according to the scriptures. We can read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, which is what we're doing today. We're teaching doctrine and it is scripture, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for teaching. And it says for reproof, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Then it says on 17, that the men of God may be complete. Now, when it says that the men of God, it says with the purpose of, of the men of God to be complete. This means to reach a maturity a grown in the knowledge of God. So this is what the word of God does in our lives. It wants to bring us to maturity. It's what it, this is what, 
or wants to do in our lives. And then it says, uh, thoroughly equipped for every good work. When we look at these words, it speaks of something that is complete, completely equipped for the, for the work that God wants us to do. Now, perhaps when you look at, when you, when you read the Bible, you said, hey, I can find all the answers to my questions. I remember a person once uh, came to the pastor and he said, he said to the pastor, he said, hey, you say that I can smoke marijuana, but I read on the word of God that God created everything. So therefore, God is the creator of, of the plant. And I remember the pastor replied to him and he said, yeah, but God created it, but he didn't say to smoke it. And this is, a, this is the important part. Within the word of God, you may not find all the answer to your questions, which is like in this case, a person that was asking, can I smoke? But you will find principles. And within those principles, you will get the answer to the questions that you have. And you can decide whether it is beneficial, whether it's for edifying or not. And then make a decision on what you need to do. And as pastors, sometimes questions like this come, uh, come all the time. And they, uh, they want us to tell them what to do on, cer uh, on certain occasions. And we take them back to the Word and we said, there's no answer or straight answer to that question. For some of them, there is not. But there are principles that we can learn to, be, to edify our lives in Christ. And once we learn those principles, then we can build upon the Word. We can build up upon the Word. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says it like this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So I want you to imagine it this way. You and I live in a world full of darkness. And when I say darkness, I mean obscurity, like completely dark. Like think about no stars, no moon, nothing that reflects light. And it's so dark that you can't even see your hand in front of you. That is the world that we're living on, full of darkness. And because of it, the one who governs the world is Satan. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Also, on 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says like this, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, We know that we are God, that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So if you pay attention to these words, it says, We know that we are of God, like we as Christians, as followers of Christ. But then it says, But the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. He said, We know that we are from God, that we are of God, but the whole world is not. It is under this way of the devil, of the evil one. Because this world is under the evil one. And we're in the midst of a dense darkness. And this is what the word of God comes to do. And that's what we say edifying upon the word. Because in the middle of the dark that we're living on, the word of God comes in and it is our light. This is what it is. If you go to Psalms 119, 105, Psalms 119, 105, it says like this. Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you think about it, he's saying, your light, your word, is a lamp to my feet. 
a light amidst, uh, in the midst of darkness, it will suddenly disperse the darkness. It will reveal the path before us. This is what it will do. Every stone, every twisted root that becomes visible, it becomes visible under the light. So as we're walking on this darkness age, the light comes as a lamp to save us, to direct us on the right path, to make sure that we don't fall. And here's where the, God, the, the word of God enters as a light, as a guide. And we said it on the first message that we gave uh, two weeks ago. We said the word of God is like that manufacturer, uh, manufacturer uh, manual for the men, for the for our lives because he's the one that created us and he gave us the manual for life on John 1 verse 4 it says like this John 1 verse 4 chapter 1 verse 4 it says in him was life and the life was the light of men and it says on 5 and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it now if you think about it it says the, the darkness can never extinguish light. Can never do that. You get into a room that is dark, you turn the light on and the darkness flies away. There is no way that the darkness can ever extinguish light. And just as a physical light dispels darkness, a lot, uh, this is what the Word of God does in our lives. As we build in upon the Word, it clears up our paths so that we can see clearly our path. And when we study the scriptures, we look on Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. That he talks about two men. One is a wise man, and the other one is a foolish man. On Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it says like this. Therefore, whoever hears those, uh, these sayings of mine and, do, and does them, I will, liken, I will liken him to wise men who build his house on the rock. Now li listen to those words. He says, therefore, whoever hears those sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to wise men, to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And he's talking about two, two different kind of men. The one is a wise man, but if you go to verse 26, it says, but everyone who hears those sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And he gave us an example of two people, one that is wise and one that is foolish. But since, we, since God gives us these words, saying uh, two different kind of men. Also, according to the Bible, no, they're not just these two types of builders, but there is also a type of builder, they are women. And the words speak to both, for us as men and to the woman too. And in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1, there are also two types of different uh, builders, two types of builders, because we know that one is the one that hear the words, the other one is uh, who hear, they both hear the word, but one puts it into practice, the other one doesn't. One is called the wise, the other one's called the foolish. Now, just the same, there's two types of women. On Proverbs chapter 14, verse one, it says, the wise woman builds her house. But the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Now, I was mentioning that today is Mother's Day, and the Lord has place, had place in my heart to speak about something special for the mothers within this series of building up on the Word. And we're talking about the Word of God is the one that builds us up. We're talking about two men that build their house, one on, 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 on the sun, the other one on the rock. But just like those two men, there's two women. One woman builds her house 
and the Bible calls, calls her wise. The other one is a foolish. Why? Because he destroyed his own, her own house with her own hands. Now, I don't know if you have, if you have witnessed this before, women who are very wise and they build upon the word, not, not only their lives, but you can see the, life, the lives of their children, the, li the, the, life of, uh, the lives of their family, and they're very prudent, and they're hardworking, and they know how to teach their children. They're intelligent. They're not quick temper, nor foul mouth, nor lazy at all. And if you, you see them thinking three to four times before they speak, this is what we call a wise woman. And Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10, it speaks to us about this kind of woman. And in fact, I'm going to read it to you in a New Living Translation. Proverbs 31, verse 10, says like this. A wise of noble character, a wife of noble character, it says. And then it says in verse 10. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her, can trust her, and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, no harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and ambusily uh, spins it. She is like a merchant ship, bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household, for her household, and plan the day's work for her servant girls. She goes to inspect a field and buys it. With her earrings, she plants a, vi a vineyard. With, uh, with her earrings, she plants a vineyard. She's energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the, la into the night. Then it says on verse 19. Verse 19, it says, Her hands are busy spinning thread. Her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She had no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. And then it continues in verse 22. It says, she makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple ground, uh, gowns. Her husband is well known in the city gates where he sits with other civil leaders. She makes belted lining garments and sashes to sell them to the merchants. She's clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. And then it says on 28, her children stand and bless her. Her husband prays her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. This is on verse 30. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will, greatly, will be greatly, uh, greatly praised. Regard her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare, declare her praise. This is the influence of a woman of God. I have called this message the influence of the mother because a person, a woman that is a woman like the virtuous woman, is a woman that, it will, that will influence not just her family, but anyone, anyone around her. I would like to, to continue with the question. I know that in today's age, it's hard to to have the people uh, outside of the word to define what the woman is, and, and you've probably seen it all in, in TV or in all these documentaries that they have come out with saying that people cannot even define what a woman is. And defining a woman 
or defining a mother, the Bible mentions that a mother is a woman who has conceived children. And this is actually the literal meaning of mother. But also a woman, according to the dictionary, is an adult female person. And he's talking about how in our age, and since we know from the word of God, this has been the meaning for a woman or for a mother. But you can see that today, meanings have changed. And today they're trying to, to take us to believe that a woman is not an adult female person, but that it is anybody who declares to be. And this is how, how the world is taking over what the word of God has said. And this is why we need to be edifying upon the word. Because the word of God is truth. And it, will, and it, has, def, uh, it has defined us for who we truly are. Because he is the creator of the, of the human race and everything that we know. Now, when we look at these words, he talks about a prudent woman. He talks about a woman that is righteous. That is according to the word of God. But it also, on the verses before Matthew 7, he spoke about two people, two men. A man who built his house upon the rock and a man who built his house upon the sand. And on this verse of Proverbs, it speaks of two, wo two women. One that is wise and builds her house and the one that is a foolish and destroy her own house. And the interesting part is that the woman that is foolish destroys her house with her own hands. This is much different than the men on Matthew, on Matthew 7. Because the men on Matthew 7, they both built, built a house, although one built it on the sun, meaning it, wasn't, it didn't have roots, it didn't have good foundation, some, some solid foundation. And since it was lacking a solid foundation, when the problems came, the house fell down. Now, in a different manner happens to Proverbs because in Proverbs, the problems didn't came. The woman destroyed her own house. And this is, this is the crazy part because despite many of the differences that they may have within the man and the woman, if the woman is foolish and not a wise woman, she would destroy her own house. And this is, a, this is the interesting part because as woman, God has given woman a special gift. And the special gift that God has given woman is that they are very close to their children. Their children follow the woman naturally. And the woman has a strong influence on the children naturally because the children love, they love their mother despite their differences despite the spankings that they may have gotten with the flip-flops through the years, despite, despite anything that their mother could have, uh, could have done to them or treated them. I remember the other day I saw a video, and on this video it says, uh, a man was saying, oh, how, how I remember when I used to run with my mom. And it was funny because he wasn't running with his mom. He was running from his mom because the mom was behind him with the, with the flip-flop ready to spank the child. And he, and he mentions, like, even though, like, my mom did that to me, he was mentioning, he said, I still loved her. And he was, he was talking about in the context of Mother's Day. He said, I still love her. And this is what God has given the mom the special as a special gift where they are, where the children listen to them, where the children love them, even though they may have done something that they don't like. And this is a very important matter because as women, God has given uh, the mother of, the, of children a special gift of influence their children. This is why I call this message the influence of a mother. 
because God has given a special gift to them to be influencers. And even though the mother may not be an influencer for the world or an influencer for anybody outside of her circle, the mother is an influencer for their children. And the children are watching her and the children are always paying attention to what she says, what she does, how she say things, how she does things. When I look at the Bible culture, the people in the Bible, most of the time weren't called by their names. They were called by the, uh, they call it honorifics. And a woman in the Bible could be known as a daughter of, a wife of, or a mother of. This is how the Bible, uh, in the Eastern Bible culture, a person was often called. And when I look at this, I can see a few examples of women who, who we know by the honorific names. For example, I can mention a few, and we can know the woman with the issue of blood. This woman is known as the woman with the issue of blood because of the issue that she had or the illness that she had. Or how about the Samaritan woman, a woman that was in Samaria and met with Jesus? How about the woman that came to Jesus when her daughter was possessed? We know her as a Syrophoenician woman. Syrophoenician woman. How about the widow who touched Jesus' heart when she gave her offering and she gave that, that, the bit of a coin and Jesus said she gave more than everything in this house. We, we know these women because, uh, uh, because of how the word speaks of them. By the honorifics, we said. Not by their names. But even then, even, we, even if we don't know their names, these women have a tremendous influence at a spiritual level. If you think about it, to the point that we still talk about the woman with the issue of blood and her faith. Knowing that she spent all her money in, 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 in different doctors. But then she heard about Jesus and, and she came to Jesus believing that he could heal her. We know the Samaritan woman and we know her as a great evangelist. Because when Jesus came, she thought of herself as a very religious woman. But then Jesus came in and said, no. You believe you're a religious woman, but you have it all wrong. And Jesus started declaring who he was and what he came for. And she believed. She got converted. And she went and preached to the men on her city. And the men were converted. How about this Syrophoenician uh, woman? The woman who lived in Phoenicia which she was at that time administered also by Syria. That's why I say Syrophoenician woman. And this woman came in to, to Jesus saying her daughter was possessed. And Jesus said, well, I can, I can give, uh, basically he said, I, I cannot just give the food to the dogs. I have to give my food to the children. Talking about the children of Israel. But that woman had a strong faith, and he said, even the dogs eat from the tables of their, of their masters. And she had a strong faith, and Jesus noticed that faith. And we know these kind of women for, for what they did. But we don't know their names. But they, were, they had a strong influence in a strong spiritual level. And when I go to Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, I see a woman. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. A woman that is called a daughter of Levi. It says on chapter 1, And a man of the house of Levi went and took his wife, and took as wife a daughter of Levi. It says on verse 2, So the woman conceived and, and bare a son, and when she saw that her that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. And it's important to, 
to point who we're talking about. On Exodus chapter 2, we know that it's the story of the Exodus. The, the, the people of God exiting uh, Egypt for the land that God has promised them. Now, uh, to be able to be free from the Egyptians. So when we look at these people coming out of Egypt on Exodus, we notice that there is one woman from the, from the house of Levi. This woman, it was the mother of Moses. We can see that she bare a child and she hid him three months. The reason why she hid him, she hid him three months is if you read chapter 1 of Exodus, you notice that the king of Egypt had mentioned that as because of the people of Israel had grown so strong and so, and so many, they have multiplied so many or exceedingly, it says on, on the word, the king of Egypt or the pharaoh of Egypt has said to kill the male sons of the Hebrews. So the, if you look at chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, it says, So the Pharaoh commanded to all his people, saying, Every son who is born you should cast into the river, and every daughter you should save alive. The Pharaoh commanded to all his people, saying, Every son who is born you should cast into the river, and every daughter you should, you should save alive. This is the reason why this Levite woman was hiding her son. Because the Pharaoh has commanded for all people, saying, Every son who is born you should cast into the river. And it wasn't to cast down to float on the river. It meant to kill the children in the river. If you think about it, this mother, this Levi mother, she risked her life. And not just her life, but the life of her family to save one life, to save the life of that child, Moses. And I want you to notice the difference between a mother on those days and a mother today. And not all of them, of course. But the mother of this century, nowadays, instead of giving her life and instead of protecting the children's life, now they are manifesting, now they're de doing demonstrations and march for the right to kill their child, to kill their own children. And we can see how twisted the world has gotten. Before they were protecting the children, and the, like this mother protecting her own children from the king Pharaoh, compared to today's age, this generation that is raising up, wanting to kill their own children. On the, on the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, But when she could no longer hide them, she took an ark of bushes for him, dotted with an asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it into the reeds by the river bank, by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Now, something to point out. Who is this woman? Who is this woman? Who is this Levite woman who risks risk her own life, risks the life of their family to protect this child? And when he got too much to protect, who is this woman that for some people may say it may not be an important woman since the name is not mentioned on this specific verse? And some people say, well, if the woman is not even mentioned her name, she must not be important. And I can see something within these few words. And it is that the same thing that was happening to this woman, this Levite woman, is happening to many women today. Like her, there are many mothers who perhaps no one knows their names. 
I just know her as the woman I see. And they could be mothers that nobody knows their names. They might not have hundreds of followers. They may not have, they might not be an influencer on a on an outside level. But just as this mother of Moses has a strong influence on their children. They might not be an influencer mother or an influencer outside, but if you have noticed this, I noticed this within the Bible, and is that many of the men and women of God that were, that were uh, saved for the purpose of the gospel and to share the gospel or, to, or, or that God did something through them within the word, there's often very little mention about their mothers. And it's because the mother has a strong influence. And we know that behind every child, there is a strong parent, either a mother or somebody to parent them and teach them. Now, when we look at all this, I can say, that this mother was a strong influence on, on his children, on Moses. Remember, she raised him up. Even though the story, the devil meant to kill Moses by dictating that every male child should be killed in the river, God switches the purposes or uses the purposes from the devil to do his will. And what the devil thought for bad, God change it, changes it for good. This woman that on Numbers and Exodus, her name is said only twice within the Bible. And her name is this, it says on Numbers chapter 26, verse 15, 59. Numbers 26, 59, it says, the name of Amram's wife was Johebet, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. And to Amram, she bore Aaron and Moses and their sister Miriam. Now, Johebet, that was the name of this Levi woman. And Johebet was a woman we could describe as unknown Maybe, since it was hardly ever mentioned, maybe you didn't even know the name of the mother of Moses. Maybe you never heard of her. Maybe you just knew that it was that woman that left her child at the river. But God had a strong purpose for her. At that point where she said, I can no longer hide this child i'm going to i'm going to be the cause for my family gets killed my my kids to get killed my family myself and you can imagine a woman of god saying god there's nothing i can do and i'm not going to kill this child but i'm going to give it in adoption i'm going to put it on the river and i'm going to let it be your will and if you notice, she didn't throw him on the river to kill him. She covered him and made sure that it was warm enough and sent it down the river and even put a child in charge of watching what was going to happen with that child. And if you look into the word on Exodus, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, then the daughter of the Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw her child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. And we don't have to be much of an analyst, uh, of an, uh, of an uh, an analyst, of an analyst to know that the Pharaoh's daughter 
notice that this child, it wasn't just a pretty child, but this child was a Hebrew child. She noticed that it was an, an, Egypt, an Egyptian child. And even then, God used her to save Moses. And it comes to a story. This story, this story comes to the end for us, letting us know that even when the mother thinks that there is no hope, and even when the mother thinks that every option has closed on her, and that she has no more option but to let go of her children, like she did on this case, we can see a strong influence of this woman to us of believing that God is strong and, the, and believing that God can do miracles to return that child back to her. It took a strong faith to let go of that child in the river, but knowing that God had a purpose and leaving that child on the river, that woman picking up, picking up that child, it says on verse 7, the sister said to the Pharaoh's daughter, should I go call a nurse for you from, from the Hebrew woman that she may nurse the child for you? Then it says on verse 8, and the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went to call the child's mother. Now, this is, and it has to be a miracle from God. The woman who was, who was the mother of the child is the one that gets called by her own daughter to help raise Moses. She was her own child. And if you don't think that that's God's plan, then I don't know where else could be. Now, Mir Miriam, without saying anything, she went happily as soon as she saw her brother being picked up and offer to bring a woman. If you notice, it takes God's plan for the princess or the daughter of the Pharaoh to say, to say, go and bring her. She could have said, no, I have other plans. She could have said, no, I'm going to give it to my dad. She could have said other things, but instead, she didn't. Instead of doing that, she said, yes, go, bring her over. And this is very interesting to see because the devil's plan was frustrated by, his, by God's plan. Think about it this way. The devil had a plan and he told the Pharaoh to kill all the sons. And he did so. He said, every child that is male and is to be killed, thrown into the river. But when God has a plan, even the devil's plans works for the advantage of God. Without the Pharaoh saying that the children has to be tossed on the river, Moses couldn't have gone to the, to the spot where he was. It was all within God's plan. So this leaves us, this leaves us a, 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 um, a teaching for us today especially for the mothers here today. And the teaching is, even when the times seem hard, you need to trust in God. Le knowing that even when the devil plans, the devil's plans are to hurt you, God will use them for your good and for your advancement in the faith, to grow you in the faith. So we should not be afraid but also to know that you as a mom are a great influence on your children. And many don't seem to understand that they are a great influence on their children. And when they finally understand of their influence they have on the children, it's too late most of the time. And he gives us a teaching. A wise woman will build her house. And a foolish woman would destroy her house with her own hands. And I would like you to stand on your feet. We're going to pray to end.
And the word of God has speak to our hearts. The word of God keeps speaking to us. And the word of God wants the mothers and everyone, but especially the mothers since we're speaking on this subject, to be responsible mothers. Even, the, even if the world won't know their names, just like uh, Jochebed, even if the world may know her name, she still, it's a mother that has an enormous responsibility before God regarding the type of influence they extend to their children. And God has given us, uh, God has given us uh, that gift of influence we need to be careful with it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this, this evening, giving you thanks for your word, because we understand that you have called us to do your, to do your work. You have called us into your purposes, to your purpose. And this evening, God, you have speak to our hearts. I speak to the mothers here today, saying that they are a great influence on their children. And just like Jochebed, uh, she perhaps didn't know that she was, she was raising up Moses, which she would be the person who, which will lead his people out of slavery. She had to raise him up in your word. And God, we come before you asking you for each one of the mothers that are here today and every one of the women that are here today, that they could be a woman, a wise woman that edifies upon your word. Not a woman that destroys her own house with her own hands, but a woman that builds up, a woman that will edify her house in, upon your word. We bless them and we ask you that you continue to work in their lives as you, do, as you, as you have done today. You, have, you continue to do so, God. We thank you for your word. Thank you for each one of the persons that are here today, the ones that are watching too, God, and they will watch later. We thank you for their lives because there is no coincidence that this word was given. You had a plan and a purpose. And you are asking from us to be wise. You require from us that we will submit to your word to following your commandments. And this is what we want to do, God. We bless them. And we put them in your hands. Because they are saving there, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Your faithfulness reaches to the heavens. Faithful is your truth. Faithful are your Thank you. 
showing us the way. Thank you for giving us your word, Lord, and establishing precepts for making your word the base of our lives. We want to follow you, Lord God. We want to build our house, our lives, our families on your word and honor you and glorify you in everything that we do, Lord. Receive all the glory, Lord, and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a clap of praise today, church. Amen, amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. For all the mothers, have a wonderful Mother's Day, and we will see you next time. God bless you.